Okay, so while I get my pens, uh, what I wanted to cover today was the start of chapter three in Hitler, and this has to do with what they call mechanical properties of materials. And so if you think about it, we've already talked about stress, and we've talked about strain, but given a, what we haven't discussed is given a particular stress, what's the strain, or vice versa, given a strain, what's the resulting stress? And that relationship is dictated by the material. Some materials will have different relationships between the stress and strain than other materials. So, obviously, um, I'm looking for an eraser, <laughs> right? So, obviously, if I put the same force on this eraser, it's going to stretch more than if I put the same force onto, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't say force, that's really, that's really kind of lame of me to say force. If I put the same stress on this specimen, the resulting strain should be more than if I put the same stress on something stiffer, say like this metal um, uh, tube. I probably to have apples and apples. I should, if they were the same cross-sectional area, then the forces would be the same. But again, this is stiffer, so if I put the same stress on it, the strain will be less. Okay, so it's actually a function of the material. And actually. <laughs> Under different uh, operating conditions, under different environments, even the same material can respond differently. If you, uh, I mean, you've all seen uh, temperature effects on materials. Um, as things become colder, they can become more brittle, or lose their ductility. As they become warmer, they can have more ductility. Okay, now, most of the stuff we know from our materials come from actual experimental tests, and the most dominant material test we use to characterize mechanical properties of materials is the tensile test. Okay, so this is the so-called tensile test. And what happens here is you take a, usually it's a cylindrical specimen. It's threaded at both ends. Actually, there can be a couple different end arrangements, but usually you think of it as a threaded one. Okay, uh, and I said it's typically circular, although sometimes people have little, what they call it dog bone specimens because they have a square cross section, okay? And what basically happens is you pick two points on the specimen away from the ends. So this is kind of the, this region here is the um, operating line. Compute the original length of those two. You also look at the diameter. All right. It's subscript naught means uh, initially. And then what typically happens, either people do a load control or a displacement control test. Uh, we'll talk about load control where you put a certain force as a function of time, right? So if you think about it, a typical one would be if you look at P versus time, you might have one that sort of monotonically increases with time. Okay, so that would be a load control test because you're controlling the load. Sometimes they have a displacement control test where you control the displacement, and there's kind of pros and cons to that. But that's a little outside of what we need to talk about. Okay, uh, now if you know the, dis the load applied, you can actually get the stress, that's the load over the cross-sectional area. In this case, the area is pi on four d naught squared. And we're gonna just consider the initial area, right? So actually I can get the stress as a function of time. 
Now, the other thing we use is either a strain gauge or an extensometer, which will allow us to measure the length, how much it stretches with respect to time. So between these two gauge points, you look at the length and you might get something that looks, you know, something like this. Well, actually, I got to go the wrong way. It should probably go like this. Start off linear, and then it'll start to ramp up. Okay, that's typically what you would type. Start, start to see. Now, knowing the length as a function of time, you can get the change in length and divide that by the original length, and that gives us the strain. Okay, so this normalizes it into things that are characteristic of material. You know, it would be kind of if you looked at a low displacement curve, that would be dependent upon the size of the tensile test specimen, okay? And so looking at the stress-strain plot, this normalizes it. So what you have now is one could condense out the time and look at the stress as a function of strain, okay? And this is typically what you do. And most uh, engineering materials with some amount of ductility, have the following type of response. They have an initial region which is linear. This goes with a constant slope. And then it reaches, reaches some point which we typically call yielding where it starts to deviate from linearity. And often it'll do something similar to this, maybe even break, uh, drop in stress a little bit, and then ultimately fracture. So this is actually classic of a ductile material. These are like metals. You'll see this with aluminum and a lot of steels. Um, okay, This region where you have the linear response, this is the elastic region. That's the elastic response. And this region here is called the inelastic region. And it's typically associated with the mechanism we call plasticity. Okay, so that's usually the plastic region. Plasticity is uh, something you guys have all seen. I'm looking for a paper clip. This is sort of the cheesy example everyone does. Okay. Watch this. You've all seen this, right? You initially start off with a paper clip. If I bend it a little bit, it springs back to where it was, or tries to. Right? So I'm adding load, and then I unload, and it goes right back to where it started. So I load it up so the stress increases, and then I unload, and then the stress it drops back down to where it is. Now, if I get beyond a certain point and I start to load it up, I bend it a lot. I let it go. It doesn't bend back exactly to where it was. Some of it comes back, um, but it doesn't completely go back to the where it was. There's this uh, permanent set. This deformation happens, and it's not recovered. That's associated with plasticity. What happens is, as you go up into the plastic region, if one were to start to unload, it turns out that you typically unload down uh, a slope that's parallel to the low uploading. And you can see this region here is the permanent set. That's the permanent deformation. That's the amount of plasticity. Plastic deformation. You can see it doesn't go back to where it was initially, right? Like the paperclip. So that's how plasticity differs from elasticity. Elastic response, the paperclip bends back to where it was. Once I bend the paperclip or load the paperclip up enough where it goes beyond the yield point, it experiences plastic type of deformation, and it comes back. Now, for the most part, we will be working in the elastic region, but you should be familiar with this uh, plastic response and this phenomena of 
how it unloads and comes back down along the elastic curve. Now, if you were to unload and then start to load it back up again, it would come back up the elastic curve and it wouldn't start to yield again until it got to this point where it intersects the original uh, hardening curve. So now, in effect, the yield point, the point where it becomes plastic, has increased. Okay, So I should I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So let me label some things. Okay, so the the point at which it becomes plastic increases, so the yield point actually moves up, and that phenomenon is what's called hardening. The material becomes hardened. Okay, materials that are very ductile—I mean, sorry—that are brittle are going to be ones that don't have a good amount of appreciable. Um, hardening before they, they fracture. There's not a lot of inelastic region before it fractures, all right? Um, but, you know, you can get this permanent set. Um, okay, let's talk about the elastic response. So I already mentioned that the stress in the elastic region is linearly proportional to the strain through this slope. We call that slope Young's modulus, and we denote it with E, the letter E. So E is what's referred to as Young's modulus. Okay, and the units of it are stress over strain, but strain units are dimensionless, right? So this is actually the units of Young's modulus are just stress units, force per area. So PSI or pounds per square inch or pascals, but they're usually very stiff, so we have things usually like megapascals, or, I'm sorry, mega PSI or gigapascals as typical units for engineering materials, okay? So in fact, for steel, I'm old, so I only remember the English units. Steel Young's modulus is 30 uh, times 10 to the sixth PSI or 30 megapascals, and for aluminum, most aluminum grades, Young's modulus is 10 to the sixth PSI. So it's about three times less than steel. And actually, even though there's lots of different grades of steel and aluminum, uh, most, you know, grades of steel will pretty much all be within this, within a couple, of one or two percent, and likewise, Young's modulus for all aluminum will be within one or two percent of this, okay? So Young's modulus is pretty consistent. Uh, it's invariant with respect to what sort of alloy you're using. Okay. Uh, okay. So we can see that the stress is related to the strain. The normal stress is related to the normal strain through Young's modulus. So this law was reckon recognized early on by Hooke, and so we named it after him. So this is. Hooke's Law of Elasticity. It says that the stress is related to the strain by Young's modulus. Okay? That's it. So what does this mean? This means that, you know, if you're, for an elastic material, if you're if you know Young's modulus, um, you can also get the strain or vice versa. So the strain is just the stress over Young's modulus. So this is how stress and strain are related for elastic material. Okay? It's that simple. All right. Uh, this is kind of lame, but I'm going to do this anyway. <laughs> I was going to show you this tensile test. This is kind of neat. It's not too long but I'll let it run. I think it's good to watch. Uh, I'll try to comment on it. Stainless steel material. All right, what's going on here? It froze. 
See, I shouldn't do this. Huh? Well, if you, uh, here's the YouTube link. And then you can always do uh, Google Tensor Test and they pop up. But this one actually looks pretty good. I kind of like this one. But it looks like my um, web browser is frozen. So, <laughs> well, that's too bad. It does quite a nice job of showing the ductility region. And it also shows the necking effect that you get with the tensile test. And I wanted to point that out. But it looks like this is just hung up. Well, okay, we'll get back to this. Maybe I'll put that on later on. You, like I said, you can, you can look at this yourself. And I think it's probably better anyway. Is it going? There it goes. Ah, this is awful. All right, well, whatever. Okay, so back to this stuff. Uh, the other phenomena you see, oops, now it started. Just broke, but you couldn't see it, so that's good. So we'll, oh, it's really jumpy. Let's bring it back. All right. Well, let's try it one more time and see how this goes. <coughs> so this is kind of nice. Um, they do stainless steel and they take a typical specimen, uh, put it in there. Hold it one second. Let me check. Let me get this phone. 